Hello, I'm Ron, and welcome back to Popsicle, where I talk about pop culture, science, and everything in between. Now, this is going to be the first episode of D&D Ecology, which is the set of episodes where I talk about Dungeons & Dragons, particularly the 5th edition, and how you can spice up your games, either as a DM or as a player, by knowing ecology, biology, and related disciplines, because these will inform how you create your characters and games and monsters and even the hazards of the environment that can make a game really exciting. In this episode, we'll be talking about how to improve coastal-based adventures by knowing the ecology of coasts. Now, a quick lesson on the ecology of coasts or what we often call the intertidal environment. From an ecological perspective, when we talk about the coasts, we are talking about what we call the intertidal area. The intertidal area is that part of the ocean that is connected to the land and is covered by high tide and exposed by low tide. That means that this is a very dynamic, ever-changing uh, type of habitat or ecosystem, but it's still governed by particular rules. For example, at certain parts of the day, you'd have a low tide, and at certain parts of the day, you'd have a high tide. There are some parts of the world where there are two high tides and two low tides in a single day. But uh, there are some that have only one of each. Now, of course, as you probably know, these tides are determined by the pull of two particular heavenly bodies, which are the moon and the sun. While the sun is much larger and so has a much greater uh, gravitational pull on objects surrounding it, the moon happens to be much, much closer to the earth than the sun. Thus, the moon is a much greater influence on tides. The tidal forces that we see on earth are mostly lunar in terms of nature. So, actually, you can already use this to flavor some of your characters, particularly clerics maybe, or druids or sorcerers whose magic is based on, on the moon. Uh, waxing, waning of the moon, you can you can probably tie them up with tides also because tides are mostly lunar in terms of activity. However, there are certain times during the year where both the moon and the sun are aligned with the earth and so they would be pulling on the ocean at the same time and so these are the periods of time when the tides are at their highest and these are what you call spring tides. On the other hand, there are some times in the year when the moon, the sun, and the earth are arranged perpendicularly to each other in an L form such that there's a sort of cancellation of the effects of the moon on the tides by the sun and so these are when the tides are lowest and these are what we call neap tides. I said earlier that the moon and the sun are pulling on the ocean. That's actually true. That's what happens. So if you were to visualize it from, the outs from outside the earth, you'd actually see the ocean surface being pulled up like a bulge creating a bulge on the surface of the earth. So this makes for a very dynamic type of ecosystem because at certain parts of the day, if you're an organism in this habitat, you'd be covered by ocean water and so you'd be protected by, you know, uh, desiccation or drying by exposure to intense sunlight, but you'd also be pounded and dragged away by waves. Whereas on other parts of the day, you would be exposed to the sunlight. And so, if you're an organism that's uh, uh, not too tolerant of drying and, and uh, drying conditions and very hot conditions, you'd have to find some way to protect yourself. That's why a lot of intertidal organisms have adapted mechanisms like being able to burrow deep into the ground to hide from sunlight or have reflective surface surfaces. That's why a lot of uh, snails in very bright tropical areas have uh, bright shells so that they could reflect off the sunlight. Interestingly, some even orient themselves, some snails even orient themselves parallel to the sunlight so that they don't absorb too much of it. And there, there are several other modifications that allow them to resist too much drying because of the sunlight. So these organisms' biological activities, their rhythms are tied with the coming and going of the tides. And the tide water itself the waves carry with them all sorts of things like nutrients, propagules or larvae of organisms, and even organisms themselves. For example, there's an animal called the mole crab that, whose activity is timed uh, directly with the tides. When uh, the high tide comes in, they go with the tide, 
then they spend some time on land where they uh, hunt for food then when they're done eating they just wait for the low for the tide to recede and then they'll go with the receding tide back to the open ocean the second major ecological importance of intertidal areas and uh, coastal waters is that they regulate the temperature of the coast and the surround and the close uh, terrestrial area so this would mean that for example uh, just because a uh, part of your game map a part of your game world is near the poles and so you would expect everything to be very cold coastal areas in these uh, places don't have to be necessarily cold especially if they are in the eastern coast of your continent why is that uh, along the coasts of continents you have what are called gyres or currents going in a circular motion now these gyres consist of three currents you have the western boundary current you have the eastern boundary current and the transverse current between them as suggested by the name the western boundary current is that part of the circular gyre that is on the west side okay then the east side of the gyre is what you call the eastern boundary current now because these gyres are going clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere they are carrying warm water from the equator toward the western boundary current and so that means that western boundary currents carry warm water whereas eastern boundary currents coming from the poles in either the north or, or southern hemisphere would be carrying cold water so on your world map if you have a continent or a particular place where the adventurers are at a particular time uh, and they're near the poles and so you would expect it to be cold but they happen to be in the eastern coast of the continent then a western boundary current is bringing warm water there and so that part of the continent is warmer than the rest of it particularly inland where water currents aren't able to regulate the temperature so this could make for some interesting changes in the ecology and the monsters that could be found in these particular coastal areas a good example to visualize this would be penguins and their distribution in the galapagos islands normally penguins are found in cold polar areas right so you wouldn't expect to find them in the galapagos which are tropical but they are able to persist and live in the galapagos islands because where the galapagos islands there are there's the humboldt current which is an eastern boundary current which is carrying cold water towards the Galapagos Islands. And the third major ecological importance of coasts is that they are regions of what we call upwelling. Have you ever wondered why much, much of humanity uh, subsists on fisheries, particularly along coasts? That's because the coastal areas are very, very highly productive in terms of nutrients and energy. The reason why you have so much coastal fish that we eat is because these fish rely on plankton Okay, which are themselves relying on nutrients that are found in large amounts in the coastal areas. And this is because along coastal areas, you have the process called upwelling, bringing cold, nutrient-rich water from the bottom of the ocean up to the coasts. Why does this happen? That's because whenever wind goes against the shore, it will displace the water on the top or on the surface of the ocean uh, and so, of course, if the top is displaced, something has to replace it. And what replaces the top of the water is what comes from beneath, which is cold water. Because remember, warm water lies over cold water, being less dense than cold water, right? So it's cold deep water that goes up during upwelling, carrying with it nutrients. Because the cold bottom layers of the ocean actually carry more nutrients than the warm upper surfaces. And this is why you have such a rich food web of plankton and fish and even higher predators in coastal areas. So these are the basic ecological features of coasts that you can play around with. But aside from that, you can expand your notion of what a coast is. You don't just see stretch of sand and rock, okay? which of course you can actually extend even further to coastal dunes, which look like deserts, but they're found near the coasts. You can stretch the coastal 
into mangrove areas. Okay? In, in case you're not familiar with mangrove areas, especially if you come from the temperate regions of the world. These are the places, particularly in the tropics, where you have very tall uh, mangrove trees found in the estuary, which is that region between river and ocean. And so the salinity is intermediate between salt water and fresh water. But these, these trees are thriving in these particular areas because they've adapted to the high salt condition. They're able to secrete excess salts through their leaves. And these mangrove habitats can be uh, ecosystems rich in life that you wouldn't normally expect to find along coastal areas. In the temperate regions, instead of mangroves, you have what are called salt marshes, which are characterized by a dominant herbaceous vegetation like uh, shrubs, grasses, that have, have become adapted to high salt conditions in the water. Now, having told you of these ecological features of coasts, there are certain adventure hooks that I can give you or I can suggest to you uh, that you can play around with. For example, uh, given what we've said about upwelling, providing nutrients to coastal areas, and this is why you have a lot of fisher folk relying on coastal resources, you can have the party being commissioned by the fisher folk uh, in a particular coastal town to investigate why there aren't any more fish. They're not catching any more fish. So, uh, well, of course, the characters don't necessarily have to have the ecological knowledge unless they're druids or rangers. Uh, and a good nature check or a su successful nature skill role uh, might be able to tell them about this connection between upwelling. So you can actually extend the biological knowledge that you're gaining here to what the characters can uh, potentially get when they make a nature uh, check. Uh, and so, uh, once they find out, either through that successful check or by reading in uh, reading from books by a sage or by their uh, by, in a local library, they'd be able to link it possibly to uh, the process of upwelling stopping, and maybe they can investigate down there by going under the water somehow magically, and be able to determine that it's a spell effect, a lingering spell effect, or a monster that has been stopping the upwelling. In real life, one of the most important ecological problems that the coasts are facing is coastal pollution. This can, be, this can come from many different sources like effluents or uh, toxic uh, releases from sewage systems, from re coastal resorts, from factories, etc. etc. You've probably seen uh, some movies like The Bay, for example, that talk about mutation of organisms because of these pollutants. So this is an interesting hook that you can use, a coastal town being ravaged by highly mutated animals. If you're familiar with Junji Ito's Gyo, that could be an inspiration for you. It's probably going to be a matter of getting the stats of fish and several other aquatic organisms like crabs and adding some uh, metallic parts to them, allowing the fish to be able to walk on land with very high speeds as characterized in Junji Ito's Gyo. Um, I encourage you to look at that piece of body horror. It's, it's going to be a good inspiration for you in designing horrible, interesting, fascinating uh, coastal monsters coming from the sea. Now, instead of bizarre mutations, it may be parasites that are bringing these creatures from the ocean onto the land and even potentially infecting people with their parasites. In case you've heard of whales or dolphins being beached or stranded in coastal areas, there are many different reasons for this, like being disoriented by sonar. But parasites have also been implicated, controlling them or uh, hijacking their brains and maybe disorienting them also and causing them to do this bizarre behavior of beaching themselves. So you can also use this as a hook for introducing strange new parasitic uh, or, uh, or organisms or pathogens, uh, which is always an interesting thing to add in a game. There are many things that you can modify in encounters along coastal environments. The Dungeon Master's Guide and Polo's Guide to Monsters and also Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes present you with a list 
of uh, of monsters that you can encounter along coasts and you can see it here summarized but you can modify this list for example what are not listed here are tigers and crocodiles which can be found in coasts there are marine crocodiles particularly in the philippines and tigers can be found in mangrove areas insects can also proliferate in mangrove areas and so you some of the insects that are not listed uh, in in these uh, sources you can put into uh, your coastal encounters plants may be more interesting uh, plants can be found in mangrove areas like i said so any plant-based organism or monster from the monster manual or the other books can be co-opted and modified somewhat along coastal areas but particularly in mangrove swamps or seagrass beds if the seagrass can be given some characteristics that would make them more threatening but let, let's think think about mangrove trees you can modify a treant to be more uh to have a higher constitution and that would be understandable because they're living in a harsher environment which is higher in salts so you can increase that constitution score by one or two points and then you can add an attack which allows them to cause piercing damage with their roots a lot of mangroves have roots that are pointed upward and could actually stab your feet if you're not careful so you can visualize this as a modified mangrove treant being able to pierce or impale their foes with these roots they, that are called pneumatophores which is how they breathe uh, even when submerged in water so this modified mangrove treant might probably have a challenge rating of uh, that's that's higher by at least one uh, compared to its normal challenge rating if there's a, an animal or a, or a monster that's listed in the tables for coastal encounters that should not be there it's the giant toad if you want to be ecologically accurate there are no amphibians in marine environments and the coasts are considered to be marine environments unless of course you're talking further inland but the nearer you are you are to oceanic water you would find no amphibians there's a reason why there are no marine amphibians because of their biology and physiology which is the fact that they have very smooth uh, thin skin through which they breathe and they cannot afford to lose moisture they cannot survive in a very salty environment so you might want to rethink uh, including a giant toad in uh, encounters that are very very close to the water uh, if not then of course you can like for example some of the more inland areas in mangrove swamps can have giant toads now uh, some of the most common denizens of intertidal areas are the echinoderms in case you're not familiar with them by uh, uh, from their uh, scientific term these are the sea stars or what you call starfish the brittle stars, the sea cucumbers, the sea urchins. So, you may immediately be thinking, how can these be threats? Maybe the sea urchin can be a threat because of the spines, but then I'm thinking specifically of modifying sea stars or starfish and the brittle stars to become monsters. And I'm actually giving you stats that I made of a giant brittle star of challenge rating uh, 1 and a swarm of sea stars of challenge rating one half so this is the cr one half swarm of sea stars so just to explain its abilities echinoderms have what are called tube feet which are these so i'm sure you've seen these if you've ever flipped over a sea star these are the wriggly uh, tube uh, uh, suction disc like things on the bottom surface of echinoderms and these are very very sticky in fact sea stars use these along with their high relative strength to open uh, their food which is usually bivalves like clams and then when they've opened the shells of their prey they will avert or eviscerate their stomach through their uh, mouth it will, the, their stomach will come out of their mouth and digest um, the food with their digestive enzymes and acids so that's uh, why they have these abilities called uh, tube feet and acidic evisceration and now this is the CR1 giant brittle star as you can see it has regenerative capabilities because while it is brittle and easily breaks off as any of you who has handled the brittle star would know it can regenerate lost parts 
Of course, we're exaggerating the speed at which they do it. But this will make for a fun enemy. It's sort of like a Hydra, which regenerates lost arm, and it can attack with three arms in one round. Bear in mind that I've never play tested these monsters. I just created them on the fly. Uh, so test them out and tell me how it works. Tell me if it's fun to have uh, sea star or brittle star monsters attacking your party. Now let's talk about some environmental features in coasts that you can play around with. I would argue that a party walking on the sand on the coast would be going at it more slowly than normal. I wouldn't say it's double the movement or double the cost of movement or meaning there's load. Um, but I would say they're prob you can probably do it uh, in such a way that they're 10 feet slower than their normal speed. So uh, a character that normally has a speed of 30 feet would have 20 feet. However, because their footfalls are basically unheard or virtually unheard uh, on the sand, you can give them an advantage on stealth checks. When a party is on the sand and doing battle with all sorts of monsters, there's one particular weapon that you can use and it's in great abundance. It's not a weapon per se, but it's something that you can use to your advantage. There's all that sand around you. Imagine if you have a wizard in your party with mage hand and the mage hand allows that wizard to move a very light uh, weight around. The wizard can get a chunk of sand and throw it in the face of an enemy, thus potentially blinding it. Another interesting use of Mage Hand in the coastal environment is, you may have guessed it, I mentioned sea urchins a while ago but did not create a monster out of it. Might be an interesting idea to have your wizard lift sea urchins off the water with Mage Hand and throw them at your opponents. And here, I'm presenting to you uh, some stats of a sea urchin as a thrown weapon that can actually cause poison damage. If you've ever been uh, stung by the, the spines of sea urchins, particularly the black ones with long needles uh, or needle-like spines, those are the diadema, uh, which are very common in intertidal environments, then you'd know that they have uh, a toxin that can affect your body uh, in very harsh ways. They won't, they won't really be able to kill you, uh, but it can be very painful and uncomfortable. So in fact, aside from poison, you can consider uh, some other effects uh, that are debilitating like condition effects. Uh, for example, being slowed. Now, in certain marine environments, you have uh, special types of snails called murex. And I'm showing you here a picture of a shell. Just by glancing at it, you can tell immediately that it can be considered a weapon. So here, and down below in the description, I'm giving you stats for murex as an improvised weapon. Uh, it can be used for both slashing and piercing. That's the uh, that's the benefit to using it. It looks cool also. Does 1d4 damage and it's a finesse and light weapon. So you can use your dexterity modifier instead of your strength modifier. However, it's not as tough as a, as a weapon made of steel. Shells are tough. They're made of calcium carbonate, but they're not as tough as iron. Uh, so uh, I would say that they have a special feature where for every use of the Murex as a weapon, there's a 5% cumulative chance of the weapon being destroyed to the point that it can no longer be used. But then you can pick up a new Murex at any time if you're in the coast for a long time. Or you can pick up several and store them as extra weapons. Now finally, in terms of character development or uh, character building, you can think of the tides and what they represent. I mentioned a while ago that tidal ecosystems are dynamic. They move around a lot. And so organisms there have adapted to that type of habitat. You also have resilience being symbolized by these organisms that can adapt to very dry conditions uh, at one time and very wet conditions at another time. There's movement, a lot of movement of the waves and the organisms along with the waves. And there's consistent consistency or reliability and regularity to these movements. Also, coastal areas are very abundant in nutrients and uh, organisms. So abundance is a, is, a, is a 
is an element uh, that is uh, often associated with coastal areas. So these things, dynamism, resilience, toughness, movement, um, abundance, you can use to uh, build your characters who originate from coastal environments or if they have if they are magic based characters like druids or rangers in particular they may have these as principles that that guide their actions and their movements and maybe they can even choose um, circles and uh, uh, ranger class options and cleric domains that are associated with these principles of of of, of dynamism and, and resilience toughness abundance movement so I'm sure that there's so much more that you can get from coastal environments and their ecologies and play around with to modif modify your D&D game worlds. Uh, I just gave starting points. I hope that you enjoy those, uh, those tips and those freebies in terms of new free monsters and weapons. And hopefully you'll be able to use them. Please let me know how it goes in your game, even as I try them on my own as well. Hopefully, I'll be seeing you in future episodes of D&D Ecology where I'll be talking more about how ecology and biology can inform your game and make it much more exciting. See you in the next episode of Popsicle!